It is the last lecture of week 10, so we only have two weeks to go. I hope you'll be as sad as I am when this is over, but for now, we've still got a good bit of fun to go. Yesterday, we left off talking about Violet. Thank you for, you made it here today. So yesterday, we uh, left off talking about Violet, who comes to the desk looking for what seat number she's been allocated to in the Taylor Swift concert after winning the class competition. But she can't remember where it is because all, she all she's got is her QR code ticket. So we had a data structure to help Ticket Tech or Ticketmaster uh, store and find everyone's different tickets so that when someone comes with their name, they can look it up quickly and efficiently in the database. This was our hash table. It was our way of implementing the dictionary structure where we could get better than log n time on a lot of our operations. Our core idea here was to convert our key, which was Violet's name in this case, into a number and then use that number as an index into an array. So for example, if we had 100 people coming to our concert, we could have 100 slots in our hash table and then we'd convert Violet's uh, name into some number, let's say number five in the array. And then at index five in the array, we'd see what seat number she was allocated to and we could do this quite efficiently. Uh, this was a look at our table. We have uh, lots of different array indices, and at each index we are storing a seat number. Calling these keys, which are array indices, or ultimately a way to refer to the names that we're going to index into the array using, and then the values, which were the actual seat numbers themselves, which we're storing inside the array. So our keys are the names, they get converted into an array index, and then using the array index, we can look up the value. We also looked at understanding actually how we do this. So we had some function, we didn't explain how we made these, but we called these hash functions and we labeled them h, and the idea was to store the value corresponding to h of a, where a is the key, um, at index t, which is the output of the hash function. We also then briefly talked about the idea of collisions. Now this is where things start to be new for today. What is a collision? A collision is where you want to insert two things and you look up what the result of the hash function is for both of those things. So we have two elements, xi and xj, they're different elements and we know this because we're enforcing that i is not equal to j, but yet the output of the hash function is the same. So when we figure out what index in our array we should be inserting these things, we get the same index for xi as we get for xj. And so we've got a problem. We can't put two things in the same place. At the very end of last lecture, we discussed three broad strategies, the first of which was to just say, well, you should have better hash functions. And obviously, this isn't gonna work really well for most of our situations. So for the first half of today, or we'll see how long it takes us, we're gonna talk about some other strategies that we can use to try and resolve this problem, which is the main problem associated with hash tables, that sometimes you try and insert one thing and then you come back and try and insert another thing, and it's meant to be inserted at the same place as the first one. So how do we resolve hash collisions? So we had our three strategies, try and make a better hash function, open addressing, which was allow items to leak beyond the place where we'd initially be told that it'd be inserted from the first hash function, and closed addressing, which was to find some way of storing multiple things in the same place at, in the array. So, strategy one is what we're going to call chained hashing, which is to use a second hash function every time we get a collision. What are some ways that we might attempt to implement chained hashing? Let's say we have two hash functions, h1 and h2. What are some ways that we could use the fact that we have two of these to avoid our problem? And Emlyn, you're sitting right in the front today, so you get the first shot at the microphone. Um, you could end the collision. No, 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 I'm not sure. So let's say we have uh, element xi and I want to insert it into the array, what do I, into my hash table, what do I do? There's no collision yet, just. Okay, you would just take a hash of x. Yep, and we have two hash functions, so which hash function should we use? Yeah, let's use h1 of uh, xi. So let's uh, switch to iPad, and so we can follow Emelyn's instructions. So let's say we have xi, uh, x1 and x2, and x1 can be flow, and x2, who wants to be x2? 
How do you spell your name? That's what I thought. Okay, so flow and duct. Let's take, and we have H1, an H1 of flow, let's say that's gonna take us to index three in our array. And now we also need to have seat numbers for each of them. So let's say that flow is gonna be sitting at seat 83 and duct is gonna be sitting at 17. So I calculate the hash of flow and now what do I do? At index three in the array, okay, and what do I put at index three? 83, okay. And now let's say that the hash of duct, if I were to do H1, would also be three. So what, what else can I do? You the um, second hash function on X. So I could, say again? You would, you could um, take the second hash function and apply that to X2. Yeah. Okay, let's try that. H2 of X2 equals, let's say, one. Um, but how do I know which hash function I should use? Yeah. Sure. Well, what, what, let, let's slow down our thought process a bit. How do we know that we're, there was even a problem? Because there was already an item at index three. So what was our first step? How do we get to this index three thing in the first place when it came to ducks? Yeah, so we tried to do it with H1, and if H1 resulted in a collision, then we put it in H2. Then, then we try and use H2. So let's uh, see H2 of X2 is one. So now what do I put in index one? Uh, 17. 17. But now I have a problem. Let's say I want to do a lookup. And I try and look up flow. Um, or let's say I try and look up ducks, right? What hash function should I use to look up ducks? H2, but there's no way of knowing that. Yeah, but there's no way of knowing it. So let's, let's think what other information could I store? Maybe I could store something else in my hash table that would let us know if we have to use the second hash function or not. What thing do you think I could store? So let's, let's start with index three. What extra piece of information could I store at index three? You could store the name of the person. So I could store the name of the person as well. So this was 83 and flow, and that was 17 and duck. So now what's my lookup procedure? So I want to I want to see if Dux is in the table. So let's move this up. I want to find duck, where Dux is in the table. So I'm going to take the hash of Dux H1, and this was it was three. And now what happens? I go and check the item there, and obviously it's it's not him. So now what do I do? Okay, so if H1 didn't work out, let's try H2. So what happens now? Check index one in the array. What happens? It's correct. And so what happens? Yeah, and so now I read the associated seat number over here, which was the number 17, and this works. Okay, great, thank you very much, Emlyn. How many, uh, let me say that again. What do you think the runtime of this procedure is, the lookup procedure? Worse than constant, oh, yeah, maybe something long, like, So let's say I have L possible slots, K items, uh, we'll make it N items that I'm going to uh, possibly insert. Is it proportional to either of these? I've only got two hash functions, right? So at worst, how many? Yeah, it's still gonna be O of one because if we, if we think that looking at one place is O of one and looking at two places takes two comparisons, that's still O of one. So we still preserve our lookup, but we've partially resolved our problem. Why haven't we totally resolved the problem? 
H2 multiplies. We could get a, a collision with H2. We could get a collision with other items as well. Three things could map to the same space. So good idea, but we've only made partial progress. That said, this is a real strategy that one could use. Um, and if you get it, as long as you're comfortable with sometimes not being able to find the thing you're looking for. And this idea of sometimes having false positives or false negatives can actually be used to create more advanced data structures that you can cover in uh, beyond this course. So that was our first strategy. And can we have a small round of applause for Emily? She worked very hard there to get through that. Um, so this is just a worked through demo on the board where I've pre-prepared it. We have Ahmed who uh, gets hashed to index one. Um, Kunal was also getting hashed to index one, uh, but that space is already taken. Uh, so we use H2 to put him there. Uh, we use H2 to figure out where to put Kunal. Our expected runtime of this is going to be O of one plus alpha. Alpha is a factor associated with how heavily the array is loaded. Let's say we have a whole suite of hash functions and we want to figure out how many of these hash functions are we going to have to need to use in order to insert something or look up something into the array? So firstly, we've got to define what this alpha is, and it's going to be defined as the load factor. This is going to be the number of items we have to insert divided by the number of slots or cells in our array that are available. And so as the number of items that you've inserted goes up, the load factor is going to go up as well. And so for the most part, if we have more slots then we have items, then alpha is going to be less than one. If we have more items than we have slots, which is something very bad for a hash table, then alpha is going to be greater than one, and some of our analyses are going to break down. So let's do a little bit of formal analysis on our uh, collision probabilities to understand what the behavior of this is going to be. Remember last lecture, we said that one of the goals for our hash functions is that the chance of an item landing up in one of the cells should be uniform. That, that's our, our ideal, which would give for each for m, m possible slots, each an item should have a one on m chance of ending up in a given slot. Let's think about this just more simply with two slots. If there are two possible slots that you could end up in and you're equally likely to end up in either slot, then you have a one in two chance or a 50 50 chance of ending up in either slot. If you have three slots, one on three, one on four, one on five, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this allows us to do our proof. And let me turn back to the iPad for this one. And let's see how well I can do a proof here on the first time. So what we need to figure out is how many collisions we're going to get, which will tell us how many times we have to move along further and further and further through more and more hash functions or through uh, more and more steps in our insertion. So our question is really, what is the expected number of collisions? And if we can figure this out, this will give us the number of steps that it's going to take us. So remember, we had our definition for what constitutes a collision before. And so the expected number of collisions is going to be the sum of, for j not equal to i, because remember, we want the two items that we're inserting to be different. So for all possible, for all our items that we could insert, we want to calculate the probability that the hash of xi equals the hash of xj. Because when the hash of xi equals the hash of xj, and xi and xj are different items, that's, that's the whole definition of our collision. So we want to sum up all the different probabilities of uh, the uh, collisions. Now, I am being a little loose on some of my notation here. Feel free to call me out on it in ed, but this is just to ease our way through the proof. So our next step is to rewrite this ever so slightly. So we're going to have for all items where j is not equal to i, so for all our xi items. And then we're going to do a sum over all the slots. So let's use a variable k, and we'll start off with k in the first slot. And then we're going to check for where k equals 2, where that's the second slot, k equals 3, the third slot. And what we want to see is what is the probability of having a collision at any one of the given slots. Now, you and I both know that all the slots are going to be equal. We just talked about that before. So if we can figure out the probability of a collision in one slot, then we just sum that up over all the slots, and that'll give us the total number of collisions over our entire hash table. 
So again, the step here is to figure out what is our chance of creating a collision in one of the slots. So let's write that out. Chance of getting a collision between, uh, a chance, say that again. The chance of getting a hash where the hash of x j is equal to k, where k is the number of the slot we're looking at, given the hash of x i is also k. So k just refers to the particular slot we're looking at, and what we're saying, what is the chance for a given x j that x j is, ends up at this slot, given the fact that we already know that x i has ended up in this slot? And we have to multiply that by the probability in the first place of xi ending up in k. So what is the chance that xi ends up in k? Multiplied by the chance that xj ends up in k, given the fact that we already know that xi is in k. So what's the probability that, this is a, a question for, for audience. Where, where's the microphone gone? Emlyn's still got it. Who wants a shot? Jennifer, are you feeling it? No, someone else? What was your name again? I've totally forgotten. Kevin. So Kevin, what is the chance of an item ending up in the kth slot? One over m. We, we already said this. If there are m slots, all m slots are equally likely. So if we have two slots, it's a 50-50 chance for each. If we have three slots, it's a one in three, etc. If we have four slots, one in four. So the, this, prob this bit over here is going to be one on m. Now, what's the chance, given that xi ended up in uh, one in the kth slot, that, the, that xj also ends up in that slot? So what's the probability of ending up in a given slot? It's still one on m. It doesn't matter if we know that a given item went there. The next item should be independent from the first item. xi and xj should be independent with respect to the, that's, not quite incorrect. The hash of xi and xj should be independent of each other. No matter what, our hash function should always give us uh, a 1 on m probability of ending up in a given slot. So that means this whole thing is also equivalent to 1 on m. So we get 1 on m squared in there. And if we then take this sum over all j not equal to i, we know that this is necessarily less than alpha. Why is this less than alpha? Yeah, so we know for sure because we know that alpha is necessarily defined, the, uh, the way we defined alpha, let me I have this on the other slide. We, the way we defined alpha was as n on m equals alpha. And so we know if we write that, and so our proof is pretty much done, giving us our overall runtime of O of one plus alpha. Now this proof is totally non-assessed, it was just there for your edification and enjoyment. So this worked well for us so far, um, but as before, we had to ask how we then do lookups and how we do deletion, and Emlyn helped w walk us through before. And our solution to this problem, where we had multiple things hashed to the same spot, and if they were hashed to the same spot, then we'd use a second hash function to store it at the second location, was to store the key at the destination along with the value, and then we could check whether the first hash function was used. If the first hash function doesn't give us the answer, then we go to the second hash function. If the second hash function doesn't work, then we can use the third hash function, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that was strategy one. But we have some other strategies that we also want to test out to try and find the best way of solving this collision uh, problem. So our next strategy is called linear probing. And as much as this has a complicated name, the idea is very simple. The idea here is to hash something, and if that spot is full, go to the next spot. If that spot is full, go to the spot after that. If that's full, go to the spot after that. So naively, what would we expect the runtime of this to be if we have n items in the array? What's the worst case time that we could get? Bruce? Uh, we, we could get O of n, naively thinking about it. Because if we have n, it n minus 1 items that have been inserted, 
and we need to look at all of them to get to the next free spot, then worst case, we could possibly get O of n time for this. So that sounds pretty bad, but let's uh, keep going a little. This is how linear probing works in schematic form. So again, we're uh, looking to insert Ahmed into our uh, ticket uh, array. We already have a bunch of people in there. We've got U, Long, V, and, oh, Kevin, you're, you're in the, so we're going to insert Ahmed. Ahmed gets put in at slot one, no problem. We want to insert Kunal now, and we know that Kunal hashes to the same place as Kevin. This gives us a problem, so where do we think we can put Kunal? Okay, where's the next free cell? Zero. So what we'd do is we'd check slot two. Slot two is full as well. We'd check slot three. Slot three is full. Slot four is full. Slot five is full. So we loop back to the start, and slot zero is free. However, we've now gone through n minus one items to get to this point, so this has given us an O of n, uh, an o of n insert time. However, what's the, the, the detail is going to be, in what way do we actually expect items in the array to be distributed? And this is a big area of active research, and I'm going to show you a very cool paper that I found from 2021 in just a minute or two. I think, oh, I've got a link to it. I don't actually have a picture of it this time. Um, so Kunal has ended up in the zeroth slot. This is for linear probing, how we get to deletion. Um, so let's do a practice run. Now we have um, our full array that's filled up and we want to delete Kevin. Um, so Kevin is in slot number four. It seems pretty simple to figure out. Uh, if we go to slot number four, we can just remove him right away. However, in order for linear probing to work, we can't just delete him entirely. Why, why couldn't we just delete him entirely? Remember how, do you remember how we insert and find things in linear probing? Let's go back a little ways. So let's say I have deleted Kevin. What problem am I gonna run into when I try and do my insertion of Kunal? I want to insert Kunal. And where's he going to end up if I've deleted Kevin? He'll end up in four. Now let's say that I've successfully inserted him, and now I've deleted Kevin, and now I want to find Kunal. What's going to happen? I want to find Kunal, and Kevin's been deleted. So step me through. What's, what's the first thing? When we hash Kunal, what value do we get? We get one, and then one is filled with Ahmed, so what do we do? It's already filled with Ahmed, so what did we do in linear probing? And we check the next slot, right. Next slot is U. Okay, next slot is V. Next slot, but we just said we deleted Kevin. And so now we're stuck. We, we can't go forward. We think this is an empty, we think this should be the place where Kunal should be, but it's empty, yeah? Kunal, this is the state of our array. Now we delete Kevin, and now I ask you, find me Kunal. Imagine I've now X'd out that slot. That, this was my array before, and now I X out Kevin, and now I say, find me Kunal. As Kieran just said, we'd, to find Kunal, we'd go to slot one, Slot one is already full, so we'd go to slot two, slot three, and slot four is now empty, because we've just deleted Kevin, and so we're stuck. Why can't we just move along? Because you don't know how much to move along. And if you keep moving along throughout the entire thing, this will give you O of n runtime, and so it's no longer a hash table. Yeah, so you could do it that way and look through every possible slot, but then we're, we're losing our advantages there. So let's move on. That's our problem. We need some way to mark who has been deleted. And so what we're going to do is we're going to replace our deleted items in linear probing with a tombstone, um, or in this case with a ghost. But they're colloquially known as tombstones. And now what we can do if we want to delete Kunal, then we go along from Ahmed, U, V, tombstone we skip, we go to long, and now we can delete Kunal. Now, 
Everyone had, uh, has been considering this strategy since 1962, when one of the first ever analyses of algorithms was done by Don Knuth, who was evaluating the efficacy of this strategy. So you, he got that the expected cost of a lookup is O of one plus one on one minus alpha. So that's one minus alpha to the power of negative one. Um, and an expected cost of insertion, I think, of O of one plus one minus alpha to the uh, negative two. So one on one minus alpha squared. Um, I think I missed the word insertion there. So this is O of one, assuming that we manage to keep alpha at roughly the same value as many times as we do insertions and deletions. Now, this was the 1962 analysis, and if you pick up a textbook, pretty much choose a textbook on algorithms, one that's sufficiently advanced to have a discussion of linear probing in hash tables. And this is what you'll see. And the reason that this analysis works out is Knuth was thinking about this clustering problem. As you add in more and more items into the array, you're going to get clusters, which means you have to look through all the items in that cluster, like we did just now, where we had n minus one that we looked through, and this will impede the performance of our operations. But um, hash functions are not truly random, so the analysis that was done before showing the um, showing this clustering behavior ended up to not be 100%. Why might we in practice uh, assume that implementations are O of one? What can we do? Remember, we had this factor alpha, and the runtime was proportionate to alpha, and alpha was dependent on how many items we inserted and the size of our table. So we say that, you know, we can ignore alpha. What's a reason why in practice we could tweak our, tweak our algorithm a little and ignore alpha? So I said alpha was dependent on two variables, the number of items you insert and how large your array is. So n is the number of items we want to put in, and presumably that's an area where we can't compromise, right? If you want to put in n items, you want to put in n items. What about m? m is the size of the array. What do we know about array sizes? It's already fixed. Is it always fixed? No, 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 so. Yeah. Well, how, what are the different ways you can make an array in C? You can just declare it normally, but we have a special function that we can use, right, to allocate memory for an array. What function? Uh, malloc. Malloc? Yeah, malloc. Okay, so malloc lets us aside, set aside some memory for an array, and what happens if our array gets full? Are we stuck? So what do we do? We still use that function to add uh, slots in the array. Yeah, we can allocate more memory, copy everything from the old array into the new one, and actually grow the size of our overall, the number of cells we have. So we don't really need to worry about alpha, because as soon as alpha starts getting too big, we can just give ourselves more memory, and then we resolve the problem, alpha goes back down, and we preserve our O of one uh, runtime. So that was our strategy two. Now, strategy three, is our closed addressing. So now we're gonna say, you know what, enough of this like stupid moving things around, allowing things to leak out, why don't we just store all the things at the same spot in the array? If two things hash to the same spot, store them both de there. Um, Kieran, do you wanna pass the microphone to someone? Pass it to Max, because he's hanging out there. Okay, this is, this is a very easy one. So I, XI and XJ have hashed to the same place, and I want to store them at the same place. How do I do that? Uh, you have some sort of, I guess, an array of structs and they get it. And so what's in the struct? In the struct would be, I guess, x1 x and x2, and then you can put i and j into that. So that'd give me room for two things. Now what happens if xk comes along and also hashes to the same place? You would put, I don't know, an array in there and then malloc it as in as it gets bigger. So you could do it that way. What other structures could we use that would be efficient for that? Yeah, we could also use a linked list. So at every location, we could either store an array or we could store a linked list. Essentially, we want to have some way, uh, some data structure that allows us to do further lookups once we've done our initial lookup. Now, let's just theorize about this. In the worst possible case that you could imagine, not the realistic worst case analysis, let's say we have n items. What is the worst, worst, upper bound on the runtime. And because they're all in one spot. Yeah, so if our hash function is really bad and all the things have been hashed to the same spot, then all we've got is a linked list through the items because we're going to have to look through one by one. 
Now, what's one advantage, what's one, sorry, what is one modification that we could make to this um, if we know that so an extra piece of information such as the last thing that we put in is likely to be the first one that we'll want out. So we could use a stack. Now the problem with the stack is then we can only look at the most recently used item, and if it happens to be that the second most recently inserted item was the one we actually want, then we're out of luck. So what, what other thing could we do? Stack wasn't a bad try. Yeah, so you could just keep track of the most recent one, or you could use uh, any number of other data structures to help you keep track of things. But keeping a pointer to the most recently used one is an idea that we'll come back to in a minute with our final strategy. So let's look at a diagram of how to do the uh, separate chaining. Again, inserting Ahmed first, he's going to go in slot one. Kunal comes along and gets hashed uh, to the same slot. And so we just add him to our linked list. And our linked list is a list of structs in this case because we want to store both the key and the value so that we know which value corresponds to who. Because if we didn't store the names, you'd go to slot one and you'd just see 83 and 99 and you wouldn't know whose seat belonged to who. Now Journey comes along and she hashes to four. And so now we have a separate linked list for slot number four. So each one of the slots is going to have its own linked list. Um, and then if we want to do a get for Kunal, we'd go to slot one, because that's what he hashes to, and would iterate through the linked list until we find him. If we want to delete Ahmed, we go to the slot, and then we just do a linked list deletion. So we'd first find Kunal and move our pointer up to Kunal. So in this way, you can compose our different data structures that we've been doing to try and solve more complicated problems. And this is one of the ideas that gets used in advanced algorithms classes, is figuring out not only individual data structures, but how to combine data structures for more advanced uh, performance. Finally, our last strategy, and this one is, I think, from the early 2000s, if I can remember it right. I'll, I'll double check that for, for later. Um, this is called cuckoo hashing, and it tries and gets us the best of both worlds. Um, the basic idea of cuckoo hashing is to evict the item that you find at, if a slot is already full, and then use a second hash function to put that item somewhere else in the array. So this is not the same as our first strategy, which you put the current item in, the, in H. It's not the same as our first strategy, in which we used H1, for our current item, and then H2 on that same item if there was a collision. In this one, you use H1, and no matter if there's something there or not, you put the current item, let's say our current item is XI, you put it in the place that H1 tells you to. However, if there was already something there, you take that item out and use H2 on that item to put it to a new place. Bruce has a shocked face. Why on earth would you do something like that? If there's a second collision, we get something like this, where you might have, uh, then you'd use H1 again on that next item, and that would give you a new place for that item that you have to kick out a second item. And maybe you'd have to kick out a third item, and a fourth item, and a fifth item. Um, and then you get these patterns which show, well, if I use H1, this item will get kicked out to there. If there's an item there, that'll get kicked out to here. If there's an item, then still we'll kick it out to a further spot, which gives us this overall strategy. So, First, check if H1 of X2 is free. Our new item, see if we can just insert it. If there's a collision, uh, move the thing that it's collided with based on, on the basis of a second hash function. And then just insert your X2 in the place that it was originally meant to be. If you get a subsequent collision, just repeat this process. Now, Bruce, do you spot the problem? Where might this strategy run to trouble? Emlyn, is that a, I know where it is? Um, if H, if the one that you have X gets pushed to some second location and then that second location goes to where you, the first one is, you can get into a bit of a loop. Loop, exactly. Well, formally the term that we're gonna use in computer science is a cycle. Where we, where we follow one thing and then we eventually get back to the starting place. But it is possible that we'll have an infinite loop where you kick something out and you kick a second, which forces you to kick a second thing out, which forces you to kick the first thing out, which forces you to kick the second thing out. And it doesn't matter if it's a loop that takes one 
uh, one path to get to or it takes 10 paths to get to. Either way, you're going to find yourself in an infinite loop. So what can we do if this happens? What do you think we should do? So we could use a third hash, or we could just rehash all the items, restructure our array a little bit, and uh, get out of the cycle. Um, so if we get a cycle, rehash every item in the array. This will be done in O of n, but hopefully we should have to do this relatively infrequently. And if you do the very complicated analysis for cuckoo hashing, you're still going to get O of 1. Um, so this gives us our final table for our different um, hash function uh, a different hash function collision options, and we see that we get O of, un, o of 1 in the vast majority of cases, except for in the naive chaining where we get worst case of O of n. However, even for the naive chaining, we're still going to get an average of O of 1, but there's a detail that I'm missing in this chart. If we remember from some of the slides earlier, I had these alpha factors that were around the place, and then we also talked about the importance of the actual data that we're are using. So when it comes down to it, on most normal real data, data sets, we end up using linear probing, even though cuckoo hashing is fancier and has better theoretical time uh, analysis in many cases, uh, linear probing is the one that wins out in practice. So for the purposes of assessment, you're not going to have to know all the details of all the analysis, I just wanted to give you a sense of what each of the different strategies do. So at a high level, the thing you should know is what are each of the different strategies and more or less like how do they work. You don't need to know how to do one of the operations, but you have to conceptually know what's the idea behind it. So linear probing, for example, is try and fit in the next spot in the hash table. Um, separate chaining is uh, make put a linked list at every location. And cuckoo hashing is this weird like use the hash functions to keep kicking things out. But I can almost assure you that we're not going to test that one. So Caveats with all of these slides is you're, to make this a number of these work, you're going to need k-independent hash functions. And if you want to learn about what k-independence really means in a formal way, you're going to need to take a more advanced algorithms class. Um, we need good hash functions, and we haven't talked about how to define a good hash function, how to find a good hash function. I think there are one or two examples of some bad hash functions in the reading that's been uh, assigned. Um, one way we can get around this is to make sure that we use all the bits of a key. So one stupid hash, hash function, let's actually draw this one out. Let's draw the bad hash function out. So a very bad hash function would be, uh, let me fix this up, so a bad hash function. So let's say this is a hash function on strings. A bad hash function would uh, figure out the ASCII value of the first character and map things to that first character. So let's say that A, someone remind me what capital A is in ASCII. I think it's 65. Liam, what's A in ASCII, capital A in ASCII? 65, I was right? Good, my memory's not that bad. Okay, so let's say I'm hashing apples and I'm hashing alligators. Where in my hash table are apples and alligators going to end up? Yeah, they're both going to end up in slot 65 because of the hash function that I've chosen. So this is probably not a very good one, um, especially because most words in the English language are going to have ASCII characters of between like 65 and 140 or whatever it is. So even if I have a table that's 256 in size, they're all going to get clustered around the middle. So it's quite important to uh, choose a good hash function. The other caveat to all of this is that the results only apply for a constant alpha that's significantly less than one, um, and they're lazy with respect to, uh, I've been a bit lazy with respect to expectation values and doing all the analysis properly. Ah, there we go. There's the link to the paper on, uh, on improving um, alpha. Okay, so we talked about our strategy, which is we don't need to worry too much about alpha because we can always resize the table when alpha gets large. Um, Java tends to rehash when alpha is about 0 0.75, just for you to get a sense of what's important. Um, and then I also said this, that cuckoo hashing ends up being slower than linear probing in practice. One thing about hash, hash tables is they're a randomized data structure, because it requires this complicated analysis figuring out 
where a hash function is going to put an item, and we're treating hash functions as objects that give us a random position to put an item. And because of this element of randomness, it makes them much, much more complicated to analyze to the extent that even in your second year subjects, you're still not going to go into the analysis of the full analyses of these structures. You'd need to go into probably a, a second year master's subject to get the full analyses of these, um, which is kind of why they're fun. Okay, so that terminates our discussion of hash tables. Um, and now we're on to stuff that has never, never before been taught in FOA. Um, but because it's part of assignment two, I wanted to give you a bit of a taste. We'll cover a little bit of it today and then a little bit of it on Tuesday. Okay, so our, our new motivating question is how many degrees of separation between you and the king? And let's, let's give this to, to someone else. I should clarify the question. Degrees of separation is like a game you can play where you try and figure out how closely you are linked to someone by following people you know. So for example, um, I know Flo, so we have one degree of separation. Um, but the, Flo has a whole lot of friends from school that I don't know. And so I would have, say, two degrees of separation to Actually, change, we'll change the definition. Flo and I have zero degrees of separation because we know each other. However, one of Flo's friends and I will have one degree of separation because we have to make one hop. I have to make one hop through a person I know to get to the person I don't know. Now, the, Flo will have some friends who don't. Flo's friends will have some friends who don't know Flo. And so, if I want to get to one of those people, I would need to make one hop to Flo, and then one hop to one of her friends, and then another hop to get to the final people. And so this is degrees of separation. And it's been theorized in, in some uh, pop fiction that there are only six degrees of separation between any two people on the planet Earth, and particularly in some cultural groups, like you can imagine if you're perhaps Jewish or from a Korean community or something like that, you might have a really small number of degrees of separation such that uh, there's a game that Jewish people often play called Jewish geography. You meet a Jewish person in a new country and you try and figure out, okay, what are the, three, what are the two or three steps that we can make before we figure out how we know each other? So this is the same game. So how many degrees of separation between you and the king? Six, do you think? Well, I said six would be the maximum. Do you think you can do it in less? Uh, maybe five. Five? Uh, how do you think you'd get there if you were just to take a guess? Yeah. Do you have someone in your life who you think would be a little closer to the king than you would be? Yeah, I've got friends there. Uh, they're, they're from the UK. They're from the UK? And then do you have a particular friend who you might think that... No? Uh, Who's your most highly placed friend closest to the king? Uh, Daniel. Um, okay, so maybe through Daniel. Well, I, I can answer for all of you that your degree of separation to the king is a maximum of four. So come back to me if you can beat four, um, and uh, maybe you'll get an FOA t-shirt or a sticker or something. So surprisingly, maximum of four that we can prove just today. So let's figure out the way that we can check this, and this is going to be the motivation for the rest of today and for some of Tuesday. So this is a graph of some people in the class. Congratulations if you got your name up there. Um, I remembered you when I was writing these slides. So this is a binary tree. And one way we could imagine of friendships is as a binary tree. Now, uh, Max, how many friends do you have? Uh, are we doing like random polls? Just let's stick with this for the minute. Max, how many friends do you have? Two. Just two. How many friends do you actually have? Well, 50 friends, okay, that's not so bad. Maybe, maybe uh, I think there are nearly 50 people in this room, so you could up that number a little bit. Um, but what's the problem with a binary tree for representing friendships? Um, yes, we don't know if I'm friends with Owen. Well, according to this graph, you're not friends with Owen. Yeah. And Owen is friends with you, but yeah, you're not friends with Owen. And then you're not friends with any of these other people uh, in, the, in the room either. And Yuvani, I don't know why there's a D next to your name, but we'll delete that for, for later. Um, OK, so this isn't quite right. Um, well, it stands to reason that if Owen is friends with Max, that Max is probably friends with Owen. So let's add backlinks to all of these. Um, and in fact, we can do one better. Instead of having forward and backlinks, we can just say, if A is linked to B, then B is linked to A. Um, and then we have to add in all our other links as well. Now, this doesn't look like a binary tree at all. This is getting much too complicated. And we've got too many arrowheads pointing different directions. So 
I'm just going to go ahead and remove those arrowheads. And now we have a new data structure, and this is what we're going to call a graph. Oh, there we go. We've got our new uh, friend at the bottom there. Um, I'm not sure if energy drinks are friends with Yuvani or Yuvani's friends with energy drinks, but uh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll assume that this is a two-way relationship and not an abusive one-way relationship. Um, okay, so we've got our graph so far, but we still haven't gotten any closer to the king. And I'll tell you that's because you've forgotten one of your friends. Who is the most popular person in FOA? Uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Um, so this is, uh, everyone's got one link of separation to me. And then I have uh, one degree of separation to my high school friend Maddie. And then my high school friend Maddie is one degree of separation to Prince Harry. And Prince Harry is one degree of separation to the king. So at least in theory, if you think about it, all of you connect to me, I connect to one, I can, uh, she connects to Harry, Harry connects to the king, we should be able to get there in a maximum of four steps. But how do we calculate that now that we have a data structure that we don't know how to use, how to process, this is gonna get really complicated. This graph, which is our name for these kinds of data structures, are what we'll look at on Tuesday. Thank you very much, have a lovely weekend.